So we've been talking about where are the wall builders? We know Second Chronicles 7, 14, that Solomon has just built the temple. He's having a conversation with God, and God says there'll be a day where there's no rain. There'll be a day where I, God, will send a plague. And then he says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, right? and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So he's not talking to the world, he's talking to who? The church, those who he's in covenant with. He said, then will I hear from heaven, then will I forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We've looked at Nehemiah. I won't go into the scriptures, but Nehemiah chapter one, we're gonna get over to Nehemiah because that's where I intended to start, but I've been stuck in Ezra. We've got two more chapters, all right? And we've talked so much history through this, so please go back and get it all, because you really need to hear the fullness of it. So what we've seen is, you know, when we get to Nehemiah, Nehemiah will do in 52 days, the, the, the Jews from the time of Zerubbabel to Ezra up to Nehemiah, because Nehemiah will restore the city of Jerusalem, which is the city of peace, right? And safety and protection. And then the land of Judah. So the land will be restored. So for a nation to be restored, you have to have a city restored. Restored. For a city to be restored, you had to have the temple restored. The church had to be restored. So there were several things that took place because God's people were in captivity. Why were they in captivity? Because they had disobeyed God. They'd made everything else an idol. We've talked a lot about that, that anytime you put something before God, whether it's your spouse or your children or your, your bank account or your job, your title, it becomes an idol in our life. And so God in his love and grace and mercy moves on this King Cyrus and he gives three proclamations and this time a remnant comes out of captivity a remnant and that's important we've talked a lot about the remnant so by the time that Nehemiah rises up and does in 52 days this process it's originally one script right and right sandwiched between uh, Ezra and Nehemiah you have Esther so a lot of times we'll take things out of context like we've been raised up for such a time as this but you've got to understand the whole context of what, what God is doing here. And it's almost as if we're living it out. It's the pattern of how we see restoration, which brings forth a reformation. I'll make that real clear so you understand truly what we're talking about today. And so we get there in verse three, um, Nehemiah says, well, how is God's people and how is God's place? Always two of the most important questions you'll ever ask. How is God's people, how is God's place? He says, not so good. The remnant that are left, they're in captivity and they're in a providence that is in great affliction and reproach. The walls are broken down, right? And the gates are burned with fire. All of them except for one gate, which was the word gate. And we'll get into those gates, what those 12 gates represent, which meant that um, the, the joints were broken because the walls could not be held. So when the joints are broken, Ephesians re refers to the body as the joints that supply one another. So all of this is going to God's church, going to God's house. You with me? And then we found and discovered three main themes, right? Repentance, which is not just I'm sorry, but it's I changed my mind, I changed my direction. I go back to a path that has been traversed prayer and fasting. So I always remind you of this, and I'm gonna go back to the scripture because I really believe it for now, that um, God always uses his church as the tool to bring healing to the nations. And Isaiah chapter 61 says, then will they rebuild the ancient ruins. That's the truth. That's the word of God. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will race at the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities and the desolation of many generations. So I believe right now, God give us, give us by your spirit and by your grace and mercy to repair the ancient truths, to bring back the word of God in our churches, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our schools, come on, in our nation. I, again, I don't wanna, there's so much I'm going to be, I'm just going to, I'm going to stick on the word and stick on the word. There's so much fighting that and there's so much happening so fast. I could start right now and just say, go check it out yourself. Check out this tweet, check out this, check out that, because there is such an antichrist agenda to, to take away everything that is the truth of God's word. So may God use you to repair the ancient truths. 
May God use you, come on, to repair the ruined cities, the desolation of generations, the desolation, the destruction of generations. As we studied chapter one through seven in Ezra, we looked at where are the wall builders. Today, we're gonna talk about and move on to chapter eight, which is who are you joined to? Because this is what's gonna be so crucial because after he repairs the word, so remember there were several things, right? In order to rebuild the city, the nation, they had to number one, restore the altar. We've gone through all this, repair the altar. Then they had to restore the temple. Then they had to bring back the feast, God's divine appointments. Then they had to restore worship, right? Then they had to restore the word of God, which is where we've left off. When the word was restored, I left you with what, what happened when to those who did not restore to the word, remember death and the things that happened, the loss of things, and what happened to the people who did restore the word of God. And then we left off with the nine things that happened, the requests that were granted to Ezra because of restoration of the word. So when the word was restored, then sanctification came, a separation of, uh, for reformation. Now, right after that, in chapter eight, he's going to get into what you'll call the registry. So he had to register those who were with him. This is important because who is with you, all right, is absolutely important. And then he'll go into, and it's possible that it was just males because there, there's, I'll talk to you probably about that much more next week. But then we'll go into, because there's a lot of focus on, on the male in this, and I'll get into it today. But then we'll go into, then there's almost this awakening in nine and 10 because there's an intermingling of uh, uh, unholy seed and holy seed. And we'll get to that because that's very important. So today we're going to focus on who are you joined to? All right. And there's some things that I believe that will be personally applicable that'll help you in your personal walk, but I'm really addressing the church at large. Is that good? Is that good? So we caught up on that. All right. So God has a purpose. That was pretty quick guys. Cause you know, I'm usually about 40 minutes in doing that. That was a pretty quick summary. It's one of the hardest things is continuing to move Miguel and in this way that God is showing you. So God's purpose is to restore that which has been lost and to reconstruct that which has been broken down. So as we see, even in our own nation, ancient truths, as we see devastated city, desolation of generations, there's a huge gap between boomers and what do we call it now? X or what do we call the younger ones? Wires, whatever they are. Okay, there, there's a huge gap between thought, thinking, perception. And though it seems like it happened overnight, this has not been an overnight thing. I mean, I've had a problem even for, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty like untraditional a minister, let's put it that way. I'd be pretty untraditional. And I'm not, you know, hung up on all the legalistic things of the word or, or of, you know, that, that can happen through religion. But I would have problems like as my grandchildren were born and I try to put on a cartoon or something. I'm like, man, every cartoon I put on, they kill off the father or there's some kind of sorcery or there's some kind of, and, and I didn't want that indoctrinated into them. I didn't want that just that every time, you know, so there was, there was a couple that I could watch and those couples they tried to I mean, kill off. Like Paw Patrol was one of the, the few things that was like a cute little cartoon that I didn't have to worry about them killing off the father or having some kind of witchcraft or sorcery or anything else. And so down to the, the smallest of ways into much more blatant ways, much more blatant that we have been fighting against really hard in the last two years. And, and so God wants to restore the truths that have been lost, the devastated cities. Are you with me? And the desolated cities and the devastated generations and that which is broken down in Nehemiah. Even it's really visible because that which looks like rubbish and ruins or when Zerubbabel came out, that which looks like rubbish and ruins, I believe will be restored. So even as we see things that look 
I mean, in the natural, like rubbish and ruins will be restored and repaired to bring both restoration and reformation. We'll get to that because reformation does not have to do with building another form. It has to do with reestablishing the original, the intention of God. It is a realignment and adjustment to God's original intention, both for your life and for his church. So if you've ever had like a really bad back problem, maybe you go to get a little adjustment at your chiropractor or something. But if you get a really bad back problem, you have to go in for surgery, right? If you get, you know, you're acting like you don't know, or if you've got something that's really out of, uh, so, so there, there's some surgery that has to be done for the church. There's some surgery because for reformation, it is a realignment. It's not just a chiropractor right now. It, it needs a specialist surgeon to go in for complete realignment to God's original intention for both your life and his church. Now, his word, which is why we spent so many weeks talking about the reestablishment of the word, because the first conclusion you have to come to is the word of God is the infallible truth, that that is truth. Amen? And we receive it as such. It's perfect. It's flawless. So God will always have a people who believe their God and possess their possessions. God will always have a remnant. God will not be in trouble. God will always raise up a people, whether it's a Joseph that's gone through a process, whether it's a David who seems like an unlikely candidate, whether it's a Rahab, whether it's, a, I mean, we just keep going on, whether it's an Esther or a Zerubbabel or an Ezra, God will always have a people. And I believe you are a people of God called for such a time as this. I believe that you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be watching if there's not a hunger and a pulling in your heart, a stirring in your heart. So I pray today that, that our eyes are enlightening, that you understand how much of a world changer that in this earthen vessel, there is a deposit of wealth. It's not this vessel. It is what is in me. It is the life of Christ. It is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that now dwells on the inside of me. So what we see is we have discovered that reformation comes through restoration. So restoration means to bring back to the original state. It literally, it means to back again. So it starts with a remnant. Just in case you missed it, a remnant is that which is left. A remnant is that which remains. It is a residue, that which is left after the part is recovered. One who escapes. So a remnant is a survivor. A remnant is like the, the last part of the fabric on the bolt. So a remnant, just remnant people are survivors. So you hear stuff like a Joseph's company. You hear stuff like a, a remnant people, right? The Bible refers to as a remnant. That's that which is left. So when you look at, am I a remnant person? You, you, kind of, you know who you are, right, Moses? Because you shouldn't have made it down the Nile. Like that you should have not made it and just happened to land at Pharaoh's, right? As if that's just coincidental and God wasn't protecting you. You can look at your own life and say, there's no way. Other people don't know all of your testimony, but you know it. That there's no way you should have made it, but God protected you. God covered you by a grace. God kept you by his power, by his spirit, because God has an assignment for you. God has a purpose for you because the reality is the storm should have taken you out, but you're part of a remnant. You have a purpose. You have an intention. You, you have a job to do for Jesus. Remnant people are real people that have been through things that they saw others being taken out by, but they survived it. You're still here for a reason. You're still standing for a purpose. God still has more for you to do. And if that more is in your prayer closet or that more is on a worldwide stage with a bullhorn and a target right on you, God has more for you to do because God loves his church. 
God has a plan. That plan is always working. And I believe that you are part of the plan. A remnant people realize if it had not been for the grace and the mercy of the Lord, I would not be here. A remnant people realize when I say stuff like this, people just kind of look at me like a deer in headlights. When I say the greatest blessing in my life is that God loved me enough to reduce me to Christ because I'm in a position now that, that might feel hardened to some people, but things that would just scare the living daylights out of people. I just, it's like another day of waking up. It's a constant part of my life because God had to strip me. Literally, I say God had to strip me of everything so that there wouldn't be attachments in my life. And what I mean by that, that, that I could move freely in obedience to God, that, that, that I love people, but I know I love my husband. I love my children. I love you. But my attachment is to God. And out of that attachment, my overflow goes to people. So my attachment is not first to you. I'm not afraid of losing City of Destiny. I'm, so, I'm not afraid because if I do, God will just raise something else up. I'm not afraid of losing a friend or a person. I'm not afraid of losing something. I'm not trying to hold on so tight in control. There have been times in my life I have been, but God just allowed everything that I tried to hold so tight to that that was just squeezed, dried out. And, and as crazy as it sounds, it is the greatest blessing because I know that in Him I live and I move and I have my being. I know that God is truly my source. I know that the only way that there is breath in my body today, that there is any testimony and evidence of God in my life is because He is a good God. He is a loving God. He is a faithful God. And so you realize, had it not been for the Lord, come on, whenever God is going to build or do anything great, He always leaves a remnant in place. So there is a remnant, come on, there will always be. And some of you are looking at what is left over in your life, and you're thinking, how can anything great come out of this? It's so little. You've gone through devastation. You've gone through the, the, the loss of a loved one, the deaths of somebody. You've gone through divorce. You've gone through disease. You've gone through loss of friends, loss of family, rejection. <laughs> you're in good company, come on. You're in good company because Jesus... Uh, who made himself of no reputation, who lost so much his very life only to, to, for what? For the birthing of the church, the bride of Christ, for the gain of God's intention and his purpose and his plan. So when we are attached to things and people, and I'm not saying that, you know, you're going to lose everything and every person in your life. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying if we're not willing if we're not willing, it's what he says. If we love our father and our mother more, or we love our spouse or our children more, if we're not willing to lose everything, then we've made that thing our God instead of making God our God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God's not about taking away from you. That contradicts so much of his teaching. But what he's saying is we know how subtle the serpent is. We know how he gets in. So it's saying that God has to be be God in our life and there is none other but God. Are you with me on this? Because we're going somewhere. So when you look sometimes at the little that you have left, God likes getting you to a shrinking place. And when you look at the little that is left, when we look at the little that we have to work with, right? When you look at the little, maybe that is left in the economy or your money or your energy and you're thinking, what can be done with this? Here's God's word to you individually and corporately. Zachariah, 410. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. So he says, don't despise those small beginnings because men will rejoice when they see the plumb line, the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. I've been teaching you this whole thing the whole time. Zerubbabel came back with just a few, a remnant, but he's saying men are going to rejoice when they see what's in the plumb line 
of just the hand of Zerubbabel. See, there's a plumb line in the little that is left in your hand. There's a plumb line in the remnant that is left in America. Come on, there's a plumb line in the remnant that is left. There is a plumb line, I'm telling you. So God loves to start with small. What looks like a little, God will turn into a whole lot. It's the shrinking process of God to get to a remnant. So God will take what is left and he will restore. So to restore means to build again. It means to repair. It means to renew. The original etymology means back again. So there are often people that think you'll never come back. You'll never make it back. They think right now that the church is over with, but I'm going to tell you the church will rise stronger and true revival. It has to come because the world, the knowledge of the glory the glory of the knowledge of the Lord must cover the earth as the seas cover the water or the water covers the sea, according to Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14. So God will raise up a people of boldness, a people who will not compromise, a people with the fear of the Lord, a people that walk in righteousness, that will be back again. I'm telling you, you didn't think you would make it out of that mess, but tell the enemy, don't throw your party just yet. <laughs> you messed up. Come on. Don't, don't, don't bring out everything just yet. Because when I fall, not if I fall, when I fall, I will arise again. Come on. I will come back again. God is not through with your life right now. God's going to use you mightily. He's going to use you greatly. Back again. Somebody just needs to tell themselves back again. It's not over yet. Why? Because the life that God puts you in is larger than the one that you've been living. God has a big plan and that plan is for his church and God wants to use you. God uses what I say, little people to do great big things for the kingdom of God. You are part of something that is bigger than yourself. And the problem, I'm not, oh, it's hard for me not to focus on problem, all right? I'm going to get there. The problem is the church has, like I said, become so self-ambitious that we miss the, central, the centrality. And that's why I taught so much of making it Christo-centered, Christ-centered. Because if it's not about Christ, it's not about the church because it's not all about us. It's about the, it's about Christ. And if you are in Christ, you can't help, but to have a life that is full of goodness, to have a life that even if you're being stoned, Stephen, the glory of God is coming out of you. Come on, no matter what you're going through, there's no way, even if you're in prison, Paul and Silas, you're singing praises at the midnight hour because no matter what somebody does to you, they can't take who Christ is in you. You're not ruled by outside stimuli and circumstance, but you're ruled by the Spirit of Christ. So as part of a remnant people, you are an overcomer. That means you are a family of sons in the image of Christ. And I believe returning to Zion, a people and a place in Christ, to lead God's kingdom and people into restoration of all things. So God begins to integrate your testimony into a family of believers, in which means you had to go through what you went through. I'm not saying all God sent, but all God used. That what the enemy meant for bad, according to Romans 8, 28, God will use for the good, not for everyone that everybody likes to quote it, but for those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose, his intention. So by releasing your individuality, this is important, into something that is bigger than you while maintaining your uniqueness, then your life gets enlarged because now you recognize you are a member of the bride. You are part of the body. You are an important, unique part that you play a role in the plan of God at this very moment that time is um, for the purposes which are under heaven, that purpose is parenthetical, that you are sent into a time, raised up for such a time as this, with a unique gifting, a unique calling, a unique purpose, and a contribution as a remnant person to the plan of God. Are you with me? Because I'm just trying to get my people with me right now, all right? So I know, I know you've had some success by your own efforts, but this next level of success is going to require a totally different style because what brought you to this point will not be enough to move you forward. I'm telling you right now, what brought you, because you are going to see some 
the, I, I, I just what I believe, all right? If I'm wrong in, in four years, if I was Old Testament, you could stone me, but, it, but you can't in the New Testament, all right? But it, it, in the next several years, what I believe, you are going to see some dark days. I wish I could say you, everything's gonna be bright, but the darker it gets in the world, the brighter the true church of Christ will shine. The brighter the light of God of the true church will shine. So what brought you to the point that you are will not be enough. You can't survive off of yesterday's manna. You need fresh manna. You need a word from God now. You need a fresh praise now. You need to hear a clarion call now. You need, may your ears be open and your eyes be open that you may see. You need the scales removed that you see now. Not just what you lived off from 20 years ago. Thank God, because those testimonies help bring you to the point you are. They're markers, they're memorials, but God will release fresh manna. Come on, God, or when there is famine, remember they were living off dove's dung and they were living off of what? Come on, they were living off of doves, dung, and asses. So they were living off the, the wisdom of man, which is nothing. And they were living off of where the Holy Spirit had left. So they were in a famine. And what did God say? Tomorrow by this time, there'll be fine flour. That is a process miracle of wheat. And wheat always represents the church and the man of the word of God. Let's keep going. So real power doesn't come from knowledge. It doesn't. It comes from God. Real power comes by His Spirit. And it comes not just from knowledge, but by the Spirit of God. It comes through the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God starts with the fear of the Lord. For the fear of the Lord is what will favor comes by the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord comes by the wisdom of God. And to depart from, uh, and understanding comes by departing from evil. Now that's important because you have to depart from evil. So that means that part of your power doesn't only come by the wisdom the fear of the Lord, but also by your networks, because you've got to depart that which is evil. So God is expanding you through the expansion, which will come through, through the people, because God works through a people, not just a person. And that happens through unity. All right, now I'm going to go somewhere because when God moves, he moves. The one of the reasons that there's been, this has been like such a sweet spot for me ministering now is because there's no disunity. There's no, I'm not fighting. There's no resistance. There is such a difference preaching in the sanctuary and I block anything right now from entering in. that would not be in one mind, one heart, one accord. There is such a unity. I would rather have such a small handful. There are one mind, one accord, one heart moving for God, moving for God than, than anything that would resist that. So I'm telling you that God's expanding us and that expansion will come through unity, being unified. Now, contemporary Christianity, I'm going to get into some things. You ready? Buckle in because contemporary Christianity looks on the church. Let me give an example here. Looks on the church. Church, uh, like in Corinth, like let's take, I'm going to use the Corinth church as an example. And, and today, like contemporary Christianity would look on a church like Corinth, which had a lot of mess, trust me, with unjustifiable smugness. They would look on it with their nose down on it. Now, rightfully so, they had a lot of personal issues, had just gotten saved. Paul was always trying to correct them. They had sexual sins. They had, you know, eating and gluttonous and I, I I mean, you don't even want me to get into all the details of that. We would criticize their carnality. That's part of the problem of when people are looking at other people in leadership or certain things. They are criticizing them and, and looking down upon them. They're also being backed into corners right now, all right? They're looking down at them with their, their smugness and how God would never use that. Listen, never did I ever, ever, listen, I've been called about everything. Apparently I've slept with everybody under the sun. I mean, I'm a prosperity preacher. You know, I just take everybody's money and, and but never until the last battles of my last few years of life was I called a heretic. I mean, I was never called a heretic, right? That I actually had to go on CNN come on, and defend myself that I believed in God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy spirit. Anyone that, which tells me 
that those people that would ever say anything about you or me never listen to us because you can't hear me for more than 10 seconds and me not always talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, about the, the deity, about the Trinity, about Christ. So we would criticize the carnality. Can you imagine what Paul would have to say to the church today? Because we look at a church like Corinth, I'm giving you a comparison, and we would say, oh, how dare them. They were just so, here they were, they were having orgies and they were getting drunk, which they were, you know, they were doing this and they were doing that. And we would criticize all of their personal sins and all of their um, unsanctification. But could you imagine if Paul was writing to the church today, writing to the church in America today, writing to the church in I keep in many places today, he would be outraged because what he was mostly outraged was he recognized this process that they would have to go through, just like you and I have to go through, of going from glory to glory in our personal sanctification. He would be outraged. And what would he be most outraged by? By their divisions. Listen to what Paul had to say when he wrote to the church in Corinthian, who were only divided four ways. Only four ways. We're divided a whole lot more than four ways, which is why the church is so weak, which is why, because the church, come on, we don't even know what's really the church or what's not. Half the people, those of us who are spiritual can understand because it's in alignment with the word of God, because you cannot contradict the word of God. That is a spirit of antichrist. And you cannot operate with the spirit of antichrist and say you're the blood bought church of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to tick some people off if I keep going deeper, because a lot a lot of things label themselves, but you can look right, act right, talk right, and not be right. Be no part of it because he will say, depart from me. You work of iniquity. I never even knew you because God honors his word and he honors his name. And there are a lot of people that invoke the name and invoke the word, but they have no part at all to do. They have no real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Now I beseech you, which is a word like, Hey, I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Let's just start there, Luz, that you all speak the same thing. So that right now, turn it on. Just turn on your top 10 preachers. They're nowhere near speaking the same thing. But do you think that the Holy Spirit is schizophrenic? Remember I said one of the, the signs of a move of God is that a word, a now revelation word of God will come forth where many different voices are speaking the same thing. When God is really moving to restore, to revive, to renew, to reform, God is not speaking where people are like schizophrenic and there's all these different sects. It will all be a beautiful myriad spoken in different ways and different languages to bring forth the same edification and the same, the same, when I say word, the same end result. All right, end result. So watch, they all speak the same thing and that there be no dimensions among you. So what does he say? I'm beseeching you to speak the same thing, to speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brother, I love Paul, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, well, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or are you being baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I'm just a servant. Were you, were, did, was I crucified and raised from the dead? No, Christ was. Everything comes back to the supremacy of Christ, to the edification of Christ, which builds the body up in the edification of love. Oh, I'm going to keep on going. Stay with me. He later continues in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, for you are yet carnal. Now, what did we study last? That when you are carnal, it brings forth death, Romans chapter eight. But when you are spiritual, it brings forth life and peace. 
So he says, you are yet carnal, which means it's going to bring forth death. But if you are spiritual, it's going to bring forth life and peace. He says, you are yet carnal for where there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? He then goes on and he challenges the church. You would think that that'd be enough. But he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, and we always like to use this very much out of context. He says, know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. And we all get excited. I'm the temple of God and the spirit nails, right? Which means both a physical temple and a spiritual temple. You are the nails. You're the NAO, you, is it US or NAOS, whichever it is, and you're the NOS, however you'd say it. Ask Dr. Paul. All right, NAOS, all right, NOS. So tell me which one. It's the, you are the temple and you are the spiritual temple. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells, lodges in you. If any man, ready, defiles the temple or the temple, him shall God destroy for the temple, both physical and the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we are the temple of God, both physical building and temple spiritual made up. You ready? Our churches, Ephesians chapter two, verse 22, our churches like the stones of the temple are to be laid side by side, building us together into a dwelling of God by the spirit. You didn't hear me. Our temples. Ready? Let me go. Our churches, like the stones of the temple, are to be laid side by side, building together into dwelling, into the dwelling of God in the spirit. Do you know? Go, come on, guys. There are people here that have been sons and daughters that have gone and started their own church that I haven't heard from for years. I haven't heard from from the day they started the church. What we're to be, I haven't heard from pastors that are right around here that I've reached out to. Do you know how many stones are not laid side by side, building the temple, building the house, building the temple? If food brings us together, praise God, keep giving me food, God, because I will give it out to as many churches to build the temple, to lay the stones side by side. If it takes money that I can pay off your church, give me money, God, because whatever it takes to build the temple side by side and lay them side by side. If it takes love, whatever it takes, God, let, let me be a builder of your house, which is not just the city of destiny. I will tell you how, how far off we are because most people in their pulpits will preach against other preachers or preach against other churches instead of preaching against, uh, not so much against, but instead of preaching for what God is for are dealing with the sins of the world. Oh, come on, I'm gonna keep on going. So, so our churches are these stones laid side by side, building us together. I'm not just talking to us. Listen, this should be the simplest thing that we're in one mind, one heart, one accord. But the temples, the churches should be side by side. Let me just break it down, guys. I am real challenged right now with society because I cannot in my good conscience stand with certain things. I'm the type of person, I pull my money out of stuff. I don't have billions of dollars. I don't have like, but, but I, have, I have enough pocket change. I don't care if I had $10, I'll pull my money out of something that I do not believe in and I will not support. I will not buy certain stocks. There are certain places I will not go. There are certain places I won't go because of what they do, because of what they support. I won't do it because I will align myself with a spirit that is antichrist that is totally against that, which is of Christ. Sorry, not going to do it. Not going to support things that, that support Planned Parenthood. Not going to support terrorist organizations. Now y'all are getting real quiet on me right now. And there's a difference between movements and organizations. And, and, and it's important. So. The, the Georgetown in 2016 quantified the body of Christ on a socioeconomic level. They wrote a book about me years ago called Holy Mavericks of, of being a, one of the most influencers to bring forth socioeconomic that America is still a religious nation. So they quantified us at, one, at a, 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 the lowest quantification per year, the lowest, not talking about our personal income as people and as families, just what we do as churches, as 
as Christians at $1.2 trillion. It was 1.7, I'm sorry. Trillion dollars. Now, with personal income, it'd be 4.3. Let me put that in perspective. In 2016, that was bigger than the top 10 tech companies. Bigger than Apple, bigger than Google, and we think we don't have power. You know what we don't have? Unity, because we have power. So all we would do, all we would need to do is let us start our own banks. Let us start our own credit unions. Let us start our own schools. Let us start our own curriculums. They want to take everything away from you anyway. They're going to shut it down anyway. Let us start. My gosh, <laughs> don't get me started. I'd start our own political party. <laughs> like, like I would start everything based on the word of God because I believe his word. And a world system is going to continue to take your freedom. But Christ came to set you free. You have to know, Moses, what you're being trained by to be used for, to bring God's people into. Because God always wanted his people to have a place and to have, be a people in Christ. Are you with me? So he says that they're laid side by side. The problem with the church is not that we don't have the ability, it's that we refuse to walk out in God's word. It's that we refuse to come together, united, to really bring forth true transformation. Paul went on to issue a warrant. You ready? We might as well get the warning. I'm not gonna get far through this. To the Corinthians, which every Christian should heed today. He said, if any man destroys the temple of God, him will God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. That was verse 17. So we attempt to use this, uh, this verse to condemn personal things like sexual sins and smoking and drinking and all those other things which have personal consequences to us, don't they? They do. They have personal consequences to us. But, 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 <laughs> but Abraham, did you lie about Sarah being your wife for 25 years and still become the father of many nations? But David, did you have a woman problem? Did he ever? And, and did you never get personal fulfillment? Because you could never get, you, he had such rejection in his life that he would run into the arms of a madman like Saul. He wanted Michael's love that he almost gave up the entire kingdom because he went back because she'd been given to another woman when he was out fighting for 17 years and he goes back and he like wants her so bad and she's just the sad seed of a failed father anyway, but he wants it so bad because he never had it. And he had so many personal issues, but he does he fulfill all the will of God? Read the book in Acts, he does. But there are personal consequences in his life. So you can fulfill the will of God and still not have the fullness of satisfaction. That's why I'm saying the gospel does have individual benefits for you. But at the same time, the gospel has a greater, greater thing. And that is for his church. Are you with me right here? Because we've attempted to use this scripture in context of saying something to condemn certain things on an individual basis. But this is bigger than that because Paul was speaking in more than just the context of excess sins of pleasure. He is speaking of destroying the unity of the temple. So when you break this down, he's talking about those who destroyed the unity in the church. He's speaking to the church and saying, those who destroy the unity in the church shall God destroy. You don't even want me to get into the etymology of destroy. Go home and look it up for yourself. The apostle warned that if any man destroys, and it was through jealousy and sectarianism, which means faction pulling away, that God would destroy. The context speaks plainly in regard to the division of the church. Paul summarizes his thought by saying this in 1 Corinthians 3.21, so then let no one boast in men. When pure Christianity degenerates into divided camps, of our own ambitions, of our own desire, of our own will, of our own wants. It literally destroys the harmony, the power, and the blessing of the temple of God and the temple of God. When you begin to see miracles, power is because there's unity. When you begin to see commanded blessing, there's unity. You see it in a couple. You see it in a family. 
You see it in an individual church. You'll see it in the body of Christ. The individual who brings or supports such carnal divisions in the church has positioned himself to be judged by God. I told you it wouldn't be the easiest word I've ever preached, but it's a necessary word. Because you aren't to listen to everyone. Seriously. You'd be listening over here and listening over there. You're to be led by the Spirit of God. Dabbling in a little this, dabbling in a little that. Be led by the Spirit of God. The temple of God is holy. Our unity together is holy. Our love for one another is holy. For the Father himself dwells in the resting place of caring attitudes and loving relationships. See, God is a God of order and he'll dwell in unity. He will not dwell in ruins. So watch what I'm saying here because he's a God of love. He'll work with us to rebuild, but he will not sanction our fallen condition with power. You've often heard me say there's a difference between divine acceptance and divine endorsement. The finished work of Jesus Christ gave us divine acceptance. You're accepted just the way you are, but you're not endorsed just the way you are. God's endorsement comes through our obedience to his word. I wouldn't give Asher right now an AK. I wouldn't give Asher anything. I wouldn't give Asher a play gun right now. All right? I wouldn't hand her over an AR-15 and say, here, have your way. Well, God's not going to give us as immature believers, which in AR-15 would be nothing. Shotgun would be nothing. You understand what I'm saying? The metaphor I'm using compared to the power of God. So God's power comes with our maturity, our obedience, Victor. Because he's a God of love, he works to rebuild. And he, this is important because when I say there's a difference between God's divine acceptance and God's divine endorsement, he will not lend credibility to our disorder. So like Nehemiah, Paul also mourned when he saw the, the ruined condition of the church of Corinth. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 and 21, For I am afraid that perhaps there may be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, Slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate, maybe for you, and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned. So we should be in a state of mourning concerning the condition of the Father's house. Paul said, I mourn because I'm afraid when I come back, I'm going to find you in the same state of carnality. I'm going to sign you in the same condition of disputing. Well, we do it this way. And I have this way. And, this, and I'm more concerned about how I build my mailing list or my membership or instead of laying brick by brick, stone by stone to build the temple, the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, it should grieve us so much that there is division, there's flesh in the church today. Because we as Christ's church are also in ruins. We wouldn't see the conditions of degenerated generations and devastated cities and ruined truths if the church was not in ruins. My biggest battle, 
even in the field that God has assigned me to, is not the world. The biggest attack on my life, I wasn't called a heretic by a sinner. I'm not grieved because of what someone called me. Ask John. I can be a very detached person. Tough cookie. It's what I've gone through in life. I'm grieved because my heart feels for people who themselves are either that hardened and calloused without ever even having a conversation or that deceived and blinded to be taking a hammer instead of building that church, tearing it down. The church is so confused, they don't know what to stand for. They don't know what is truth. Go on social media. Black church fighting the white church, white church fighting the black church. I name a pastor right now in Atlanta that says, if you are, it's big church, if you are black, and you follow any white man, get out of their church right now. Oh, Elder, that's small compared to what I've heard. Do you think God's looking at our ethnicity? Our gender? He's looking at our heart. He's calling us back to Him. You'll know me by the love they have one for another. You'll know me by the love they have one for another. We've not only failed to mourn our situation, we haven't even grasped that we're in ruins. We just think it's still like life is normal. It's not normal. It will be state after state after state after state until you won't be allowed to come into almost any sanctuary. If the enemy continues, I never thought in my life, I didn't think, Dr. Paul, I would see in my lifetime. It didn't really enter into my head or my heart. Forgive me, Lord that I would see in my lifetime. And I've always been compassionate about eight out of 10 Christians that are persecuted around the world and people of all faiths. Because people of all faiths, unless it's a radical, terrorist, destructive faith that would do damage to hurt a person, should be able to freely practice their religion, should be able to freely practice their faith. God himself said, I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your seed may live. He didn't force you to serve him. He set out a path for you to serve him. He set out a choice when he gave you free will. But I never thought I would see where they would say, you can go protest, you can go to a casino, you can go do this, but you cannot go to the house of God. You cannot worship. You cannot have home church. And it's happening so rapidly and so fast. But like I said, the frog, by the time that the frog jumps out of the water, it will have already been boiled. Because it seems like it's fast, but it's been a long time coming. May God use his blood-bought church to restore the ruins, the ancient ruins of his truce and the devastation of cities and the desolation of cities and of generations. We have church, but we obviously don't have all the 
power of the living God abiding in his temple, abiding in his temple. Like those in captivity, we have fallen far and don't even realize it. Maybe it's a wake-up call. Maybe God is bringing us to repentance, to restore his temple, to restore his temple, to restore his temple. And while the redemption of man was always motivating Jesus, his most ardent desire and his zeal always has been and always will be for his father's house. He was consumed with his father's house. John 2, 17, building the house of God, the born again, praying, loving citywide church has always been Christ's highest priority because the world is his harvest, but the church is his bride. The world is his harvest for whosoever, but the church is his bride. I live in a neighborhood with about 30 something different houses. I like my neighbors. Greg, I'll go over, we'll take them something usually for Christmas. I'll borrow some baking soda if I need them. I like them, Luz, but I don't love them like I love him. I don't love them like I love my grandkids. I don't love them like I love you. you say, well, you should. I like them. I know I got some sweet neighbors. The world is his harvest, but the church is his bride. The church is who he's in covenant with. The church is who he is passionately in love with. His love for the church, and I'll be through was the basis of his last recorded prayer, that we would be one. First words and last words of a man are the most important. Father, let them be one even as we are one. It's still his highest priority and passion today. John 17, 20 through 23. For until we are united in him, the world will not believe that God has sent him. Jerusalem fell to Babylon. And I'm not going to dare touch eschatology. I'll leave this to the rest of them. Jerusalem fell to Babylon. Jeremiah's day for many reasons. But here is the main reason and where I'll get you to. The underlining reason was because of spiritual apostasy of religious leaders. So for everyone else who's just kind of coming into faith, just hang in there for me, with me a minute. Because now I have to go to a different level and shift to a higher gear. Lamentations verse 4, verse 12 and 13 says, The adversary and the enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests. I'm sorry, sincerely. On behalf of every man and woman of God who compromised truth and allowed the church to get in this condition, who compromised their calling. For everyone who didn't stand up when God told them to stand up, for everyone who protected their kingdom instead of his kingdom. Forgive me sincerely today because this word has been burning in me. I'm mourning. I'm sincerely mourning. Dealing with call after call of kids killing themselves, families falling apart, people wanting more money from the government, 
not recognizing God's their source. People fighting whether they should go back to church or not. I can't say what I really want to feel or what I really feel like saying. Because God said, don't release some things. It's too harsh for some people to receive. But my heart mourns. We would not be here had the prophets and the priests not sinned and had iniquity. Our gates would not be destroyed. The city was destroyed by its enemies because the religious leadership failed to bring the people to repentance. They lost the protection of God. Our cities are in disorder because the church is in disorder. And James 3.16 says, where there is jealousy and strife, there is disorder and every evil thing. Sometimes I find myself getting mad at the evil thing. Really mad at the evil thing. But I go back and recognize that without the church coming to a place of true repentance, true heartfelt, God, I need you. We missed it and we messed up with generations. We allowed on our watch the enemy to sow tares. We did not prepare our lamp as wise virgins. Somewhere, the church missed it. When our ambitions and our objectives, and we take our eyes off the will and purpose of God, we'll have ruined truce devastated cities and desolated or desolated cities and devastated generations. When we become jealous of one another, competitive, multiplying the American church by division. I'm good, Gina. Consequently, thank you, the disorder of lawlessness and every evil thing we see in our society, at least in part is rooted in the soul of a misdirected and a distracted church community. And what that has cost us, and I'll tell you one of the reasons, it was so silly, and I didn't even tell you this, baby. It's so silly why I just burned with this. But it wasn't God had me purposely do this. But when we have become so misdirected, what it has cost us is credibility. And John and I started doing something, and I, I'll show you what happens in Ezra 8, and I'll finish this. I'll have to stay on this track. John and I, when COVID started happening, you know, I'm not much of a movie watcher because I just probably can't sit still for long enough. <laughs> have too much hyper energy in me. We started watching a movie every night. It's our nighttime. We have our little rituals and routines. So he'll cook an amazing dinner and we'll pick out a movie or something. We'll watch a movie and go to bed. Well, last night we said, Brad, why don't you come over? Rachel's got the kids in Texas. We said, come over and have dinner with us and let's watch a movie. After all these days, we've seen about everything you can watch that you can watch. <laughs> and we done, we got everything you can have, Hulu and Netflix and all your cable and everything you guys have. And we're all, what are we going to watch? What are we going to watch? What are we going to watch? So finally, we turn on this movie. What's it called? 
The Sloan is a movie about Washington and lobbyists. And he's like, okay, because I didn't feel like watching a shoot up one. So let me just watch the crazy one of a different type of shoot up. So he just decided to watch it. And there's a scene that her attorney in the beginning, and it hit me like, Phew. of course you've got liberal media, Hollywood, different thing. There's a scene, their attorney turns around because it's lobbyist that gets in trouble over Indonesia and everything else, it's not worth watching. But she's in that and then now it's going to be, she's gonna be this come against her thing for gun rights activist and it's lobbying, it's the game. And there was a scene he said, he's telling her how, cause she's known as the biggest, baddest lobbyist in all Washington, this character. She wins everything, all she does is live to win in her lobbying. And her attorney, who's one of the best attorneys, turns around to her and says, you know the only thing worse than a lobbyist that has less credibility than a lobbyist is a faith healer. And you know the reality? That's exactly what the world thinks. But God gave his son to die, to be beaten, to be bruised, to have a possible 1,404 stripes upon his back, to be ripped open with arteries bleeding and body bursted so that cancer had to leave your body, so that sugar diabetes had to go, so that you would be emotionally healed. But the credibility, even the enemy knows how supernatural and miraculous, the credibility was lost because somewhere the church has become just a mockery to the world. And Paul mourned because the church had no abiding power because they had become carnal. God, restore us. Bring us back to you. How can we expect a world to hear our message? How can we expect a world to love you? when we fail to love one another, when we fail to obey you. I won't get into it, but I'll take you there next week because what Ezra does in Ezra chapter seven, he restores the word, but in Ezra chapter eight, he begins to list those who join to return to Jerusalem because who you are connected to, I just wanna take you to one point who you are connected to determines whether you'll get there. The first order, and the reason that I went through what I went through, was the very first order are the members of the priestly and the royal house. You see it in Ezra chapter eight, verse one and two. Then he follows the register and the number of the people, Ezra chapter eight, verse three through 14. So what was he doing? Ezra knew the structure of his society enough to directly appeal to the heads or the pastors of the families. Ezra chapter seven, verse 28, Ezra chapter eight, verse one, knowing that in most cases, if they came, they would bring their groups also. So he understood the Melchizedek order a focusing of leadership in church. He understood the power of headship in families and in the church. I believe in God by your mercy and grace, you're doing the same today. Restore the order of households. Restore men in our society. Restore husbands. 
restore pastors. Yes. Yes. I have deep convictions. I believe that God can use a woman. I believe that uh, I believe God gave me a grace to do what I do. I came a pastor by default because a man failed. I have a grace and God uses women. I'm not legalistic like God doesn't use women. So there's no gender in Christ. But there is certainly a different um, assignment for men and women. There just is. And it's very scripturally laid out. An irony of my life. May God restore us. May God restore your family. May God restore your home. May God restore our society. May God restore the pulpit. May God restore the pulpit. And may your ears never be hungry and itching ears for cotton candy. May your heart be hungry instead of you just being like, oh my gosh, there she goes again. An hour and 20 minutes. Be in one of Paul's services be 24 hours you'll fall out the window break your neck but he'll raise you from the dead may your heart be hungry with so much understanding and grieved for the condition until every brother and sister in the household of faith is restored to the ancient truths may our devastated cities be restored not because we just have ethnicity differences, which we don't as far as in here, but you know what movement. Not because we have lawlessness and everything, but because the church arises and out of the love of God, the truths of ancient ruins have been restored. The truth of God's word, which brings restoration to death, devastated cities, desolated cities, and devastated generations. May your truth be restored to generations that have been lost, God, to generations to our sons and daughters. May they awaken with truth, God. May they awaken with truth. May we recognize shepherds that have your heart word that has your oil your spirit that rests upon your temple may we hook our bandwagon up to where you are when the cloud moves may we move with you oh god when the cloud stays can we stand still will you give us a spirit of boldness and a grace to stand up and boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel that I am not ashamed of the gospel and the power thereof. Lord, we repent. We repent. We repent. We repent for allowing the enemy to be so aggressive to take territory. May we take back territory. May we take back territory. May we redeem time. May we redeem places. May we redeem this nation. May we redeem our school system. May we redeem the, 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 the mountains, the seven mountains. May we redeem media. May we redeem government. May we redeem these systems that are in operation. May we redeem them in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, do a deep work in us.
Restore your church. Bring us to unity, for there is the commanded blessing.